So then, Doug, you went from 2001 to Silent Running, which was about a million dollar budget, and um, you were directing. What was that? Well, I mean, uh, I'd, I'd just been through this great film school with Stanley Kubrick as my mentor, and I thought, well, I can do this. I, you know, I'd like to give it a try. I felt I had to be cautious. Uh, there wasn't going to be a lot of money for a first-time director. There never is. You know, so you're, it's kind of an independent kind of thing. But there was an interesting new program at Universal Studios that I, through a friend of mine, I found out about this thing, that because of Easy Rider, being an independent film, shot very low budget, huge success, made millions of dollars. The studio wanted to do a social experiment to see if they could make movies like that. And they consciously decided, they said, let's just do five experiments, uh, five movies, a million dollars each, and let the directors do whatever they want. Final so, cut? Final cut. They're not going to read the script. They're not going to come to the set. They're not going to interfere. They're just going to sit back and wait and see what happens. So it's almost like, we don't know what we're doing anymore. Let's let the filmmakers tell us what to do. Yeah. So um, Milos Forman made one. Uh, uh, this was American Graffiti, I think, was George Lucas's film. Silent Running was one of them. I can't remember what the others were. Right. Um, wow. And it was a really great time because I suddenly, I'm not only directing for the first time, but no one's messing with me. Unbelievable. It's just, and it's going, never happened again. But, yeah, but you, mean, went this from, is very you went from 2001 to then go to Silent Running yeah. where you have freedom. Yeah. And so I, you know, I had a big responsibility to, to demonstrate, well, I can write, I can direct, I can produce, et cetera, working with Mike Gruskoff and then Bruce Stern that he and I, Gruskoff and I both selected Bruce. We really liked him. We thought he was great. Yeah. I had written this initial idea to have a small cast. And to, just to set for the audience, the story, can you tell them what the story is on Silent Running? Silent Running is a, is a, a they call it an ecological tale uh, about a spacecraft that's orbiting way out beyond the Earth, and it's carrying all the flora and fauna of Earth. Earth has been decimated. There's no living thing except people in living in air-conditioned comfort. It's a Noah's Ark of, uh, for the... Noah's Ark account. of plants right. and, and animals. It's like an ark. And there's several of them out there. And so you establish that at the very beginning of the movie, and you establish there's a little tension between Bruce Dern and the other crew members because he's kind of an oddball. And then right at the beginning of the movie, they get the orders to just go ahead and throw them away, blow them up, and come back home without them. And he feels a really profound ethical dilemma of whether he can allow this to happen. And he's ready to sacrifice himself if he has to, to protect these plants and animals from destruction. Yeah. And he ends up killing the other guys and right. stealing the ship. And that's where the, the name Silent Running actually comes from submarine warfare, where a submarine that wanted to play like it was sunk would throw a bunch of debris out the right. port and make the people on the surface think that it sunk and there was an oil slick but the submarine is sneaking run away. Run silent, run deep. It's the same idea. Yeah. So that was the why I named it that. And that's what the story is about. He's all alone, and the only help he's got, the only ac accompaniment he has, is these little robots who help maintain the ship. Huey, Louie, and Dewey. Yeah, Huey, Louie, and Dewey, which made that named after uh, Donald Duck's grandchildren. Mc uh, was it, oh, was nephews. Was it Scroo Was it McScrooge or no? No, maybe not. You know, I'm not. I yeah. think they're Donald Duck's yeah. nephews. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. You know, that's irrelevant. Right. But you liked it. Yeah. But it, it was a very simple story, uh, structurally, as though it was like one man alone in the tundra of the Antarctica with three sled dogs. Right. And he's going to anthropomorphize them in order to keep himself from going nuts. Right. And so that's kind of the way the story unfolds. And he befriends these robots. He reprograms them to help him. They help do surgery on him because he's hurt himself in this fight. And um, then they start taking care of the, the ship themselves. So I'm not going to tell you the whole story, right. but that's, it's a very simple story. And you really did also do some breakthrough um, because you were using every, well, everything was practical. So you had these robots, which were... Um, you had people who had... Uh, they're, called, they're called bilateral amputees. Yeah. People who have no legs. And people can get that way from landmines in Vietnam or from Born birth, that way. birth yep. defect or any number of things. And so I had seen a character like this in Todd Browning's movie, The Freaks. There was this amazing performer named Johnny Eck who walked on his hands. He wore a tuxedo mm -hmm. and walked on his hands and he was handsome 
well-spoken, articulate, smart. I thought, this is amazing. I've never seen anything like this. Right. And that was a seminal idea for the movie, to write this movie about these robots that could be, housed, they could house a real person that had that disability, but they wouldn't look like a human being at all because there'd be no legs and there'd be no shoulders and there'd be no right. head. It would all be designed to hide all that. Right. So there's just this, this looks like a little refrigerator walking on its There's hands. no way an audience member, would, how, how do they do that? You actually sold it and made it happen. Yeah, they, they, they see, the, this is where the studio was willing to take a, a leap of faith. They had no clue what we were doing, and right. they just said, well, let's let Doug have his way. And it would be very hard today in today's business environment to get anything Corporate. past them. Corporate. And then I was trying to bring this homey, uh, heartful feeling into the movie because I was kind of reacting to the kind of cold scientific certitude of 2001 and I wanted something very warmer warmer and, 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 and more humane and yep. human and ethical and um, so that was how it was all constructed and I had things that you would never get away with today I mean I had this funky little thing where Bruce Dern has a a child's watering can. Now, there's no reason in the world he would use a child's watering can, but you, there's a picture of his daughter on the wall. You don't know anything about his past history right. or the family he left behind or anything. But for me, it worked that he had a child's watering can. Right. And then to later on in the movie, the robots take over because he's gone, and the robot is using the child's watering can, oh. carrying on on his behalf. Wow. You would never get that past the script department in right. Hollywood today. Right. They'd say, that's cornball beyond belief. Right. But it actually works. It's great really storytelling. It's great storytelling. Yeah, and, and honestly, too, the idea of what you did with the um, amputees, I mean, that really kind of paved the way for George Lucas with Star Wars, what yeah. he did with R2-D2, yeah. and then for Steven Spielberg when he did uh, with Carlo Rimbaldi when they did E.T. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, you paved that way. Yeah. Um, so you go from silent and running and... How did you feel after after the experience? Because you now had made your first feature film that you directed. How how did you feel when you were done? Well, I felt very um, satisfied that I was able to pull it off, and I was satisfied that the movie, the, the studio, didn't ask for any cuts or any changes. They said this is great. They stayed. We're going to put it out as is. Yeah. I said that's great. The shock to me that happened subsequently was another social experiment <laughs> they decided to do which was to see if the movie could carry its weight on word of mouth without an advertising oh, campaign. Yes. Huge mistake. Yes. And I couldn't control it. I actually didn't know at the time that they were kind of pulling the campaign right. and trying to see if the movie could get legs by itself by word of mouth. And so that was a big shock to me. But that was... That's such uh, an important part of the business, too. And it's a very important... You know, you, if people don't know about it, they're not going to pay any attention yeah. to it. And so that was part of my learning curve to understand that the movie business is a business. They're trying all kinds of things like that all the time with every movie. Every movie has to find a different audience. Every movie has to be marketed differently. Yeah. And I was really naive at the time about those attributes. I thought, well, I'm just going to be an artist. You know, my job is to make the movie. Everybody else is going right, to right, right. market it or sell it or make the poster for it or whatever. Um, so it, my, my life has been a, this combination of trying to work as a film director, writer, producer, and try to understand how this business works. 